Thank you. So welcome everybody. Um, as folks are still filing in, we'd love if you'd like to introduce yourselves in the chat so we know a little bit about who's joining us today and where you're coming from. Uh, the chat should be on the bottom of your video. Um, we also want to let you know formally that this webinar will be recorded. A copy of the recording will be sent out along with the presentation slides to all the folks who've registered for the webinar afterwards. Um, keeping this in mind, if you do not want your beautiful faces shown on video today, just keep your camera off if you're hopping on the mic for any reason. And also we invite you to post your questions, ideas and resources in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll keep an eye on those throughout. And if we don't get to your question in the chat, perhaps we'll answer it during our Q&A at the end of this webinar. Um, so now I'm just gonna pass the mic off to Ian to give us a little bit more information about our presentation today. Thanks, Danielle. Hi, everyone. I want to officially welcome you all to the Launch and Learn presentation today. Today, we'll be talking about the stewardship product support for producers in the Quarth Lakes and beyond. Uh, so as Danielle mentioned, I'm Ian McRae, and I do environmental communications here at Quarth Conservation. And our intention for this webinar is to come together and share some exemplary demonstrations of agricultural best management practices or BMPs and to offer pathways for financial and technical support for producers looking to undertake stewardship projects of their own. I'm pleased to be spotlighting some special guests today who will be sharing some of their local stories and resources. We have Danielle Marku Hunter from Kortha Conservation, Peter Shuttleworth from the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, Patrick Essen from the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and Robin Brown from the Ontario Social and Crop Improvement Association. Uh, so diving in, we're just going to do a quick overview here. We'll be hearing from each of our presenters about local demonstrations, cost sharing programs, and partnership opportunities. And then we will transition into a 15 minute dedicated Q&A period. Just a reminder to pop any questions you may have into the chat throughout the presentation. Um, if we don't get them get to them during our slideshows, we will try to reach them all during the Q&A period. And without further ado, I will pass the mic off to Danielle to get us started. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ian. And once again, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm Danielle Marku Hunter, and I'm the landowner and community support here at Kawartha Conservation. Um, my role is to really empower landowners, whether you're farmers, cottage goers, rural dwellers, or urban residers, to protect and restore our watershed. Um, I also want to give a huge out, shout out to the team behind the scenes, Ian. Thank you for all of your hard work leading up to this webinar and for making sure everything is running smoothly today. Um, so. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about where I'm coming from, sorry. So Kawartha Conservation is one of the 36 conservation authorities operating within Ontario, and we're a member of Conservation Ontario. Our programs and services are focused within the natural boundaries of the Kawartha watershed and a total of 2,563 square kilometers reaching up to six municipalities. Um, approximately half of our watershed is held in agricultural land, which provides rich economic benefits to sustain our rural communities. But this also means there's a ton of opportunity for agricultural projects to benefit our watershed. So we do have a stewardship strategy that was released in 2020 to guide us over this 10 year decade. Um, and it prioritizes planting, shoreline naturalization, stream bank naturalization, and the greening of urban areas. When considering agricultural projects, I'm prioritizing things like BMPs or best management practices um, and projects that take place on marginal farmland and open rural land. So best management practices are, or BMPs, are a practical, affordable approach to conserving a farm's soil and water resources without sacrificing productivity. Some examples include soil management, water conservation, phosphorus load reduction, riparian area, area management, and other farm practices that ultimately protect water quality and quantity and overall watershed health. BMPs also promote local drought resilience, they increase crop yields, and they can support increased profits within local food markets. 
Last year, we undertook a survey regarding BMPs, and we found that over 70% of the respondents in our watershed said BMPs cost too much or are outside of their budget range to implement. Over 85% of these respondents said that they would be more likely to implement a BMP if they had additional time and resources to support them in doing so. As a result, Kawartha Conservation worked with support from OMAFRA to create a project that enabled landowners to overcome these barriers and implement their own BMPs. Through this project, we created four demonstration sites across the Talbot River sub-watershed last year, and we hope that these demonstration sites will inspire the adoption of on-farm BMPs to producers across the Kawartha watershed and beyond. So I'd like to share a little bit about a few of the projects that we created. Um, the first being a rainwater wa harvesting and runoff control project. This demonstration site took place on an 87 acre farm up here in the Kawarthas. The farm wanted to reduce stormwater runoff from two of its barns as the rain often flooded the barnyards and also flooded the farm fields and ditches and ponds nearby. Um, so they were looking for water management support. We installed eavesdropping on both barns at the farm and we brought in four 150 gallon poly tanks to help collect the rainwater, which safely diverted the runoff from the barnyard and also it uh, prevented icy conditions in the winter in the barnyard and instead it provided safe drinking water for the livestock on the farm. By reducing the flooding on the fields, we also reduced the amount of phosphorus and sediment loading entering the waterways, which ultimately ended up in Balsam Lake downstream. Another example of a project we took on was a tile drain control box project. So we uh, installed these at a large cash crop operation that experienced frequent inundation of water across their fields. In the past, they had installed tile drainage at the farm to help address periodic flooding. However, the fields still grew quite soggy throughout the year. So we installed two tile drain control boxes at either side of the farm, which allow the landowner to slow tile outlet discharge throughout the year, depending on conditions. The majority of nutrient discharge into waterways occurs from farms between March and June when soil is exposed and when farmers are applying nutrients to fields. So when the discharge is slowed using tile drain control boxes, the amount of nutrients being discharged from the field and into the waterways is also reduced, benefiting waterways. But this also benefits crop yields, especially during dry conditions when water can be retained in the fields. Another fairly large project we took on was the uh, creation of a retention pond. This pond was excavated at a 100 acre yearling cattle farm that sits on top of a high slope overlooking Mitchell Lake here. Um, the cattle were often entering the creek on the property and th this caused high amounts of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen to be entering the streams and also uh, Mitchell Lake downstream on a regular basis. The landowners here agreed to constructing a wetland at the bottom of a large slope on the property, which would absorb rainfall and stormwater runoff from the upland farm fields. And it also filtered this water and nutrients uh, before it entered the creek and then the lake downstream. And although the pond is surrounded by a cattle exclusion fencing, we still installed a solar power water pump that would extract water from the pond and into a trough for the cattle to access safely. And this project was also supported by Ducks Unlimited Canada. And another uh, rainwater harvesting and runoff control project took place at a calf cow operation that had multiple barns um, with particularly high issues facing nutrient and sediment loading into the streams on the property as the barns were surrounded by manure filled barnyards. So we were looking for a way to manage this. And so I just wanted to share a short video about this project to help me explain what we did. The Woodrow property is home to a calf cow operation that experienced issues with nutrient and sediment loading caused by excessive stormwater runoff into large amounts of manure, which ultimately resulted in increased nutrients for a nearby stream.
Harvesting the rainwater off the barn roof through eaves troughs allowed us to divert the flow that once went through the barnyard and safely capture it in three 300 gallon watering troughs for livestock. This project safely diverted the water away from the barnyard, drastically reducing the concentration of contaminants and sediment entering the watercourse. muted there for a second. So we actually have videos like this for each of the projects we completed in partnership with OMAFRA and they're all available on our farm management webpage as well as our YouTube channel, which um, perhaps Ian, I don't know if you have the link there to pop in the chat and otherwise I'll send it out in the follow up email. Uh, we also have more information and resources about different farm management techniques listed on the same webpage. So we'll be sure to get you that information. And I just wanted to close off here with a little bit about our cost sharing program. Um, so to support more agricultural projects like these, we have the Kawartha and the Scugog Water Funds to support landowners who want to take on environmental projects that improve water quality. These grant programs are available to landowners both in the city of Kawartha Lakes and the region of Durham, who also fall into the Kawartha Conservation Watershed or our jurisdiction. The Water Fund is a cost sharing program that typically covers up to 50% of a project cost up to a maximum amount, although the percentage and the amounts covered are variable depending on your location and your project type. Um, more on that in a second. So projects can include livestock exclusion fencing, manure management, barnyard eaves troughs, towel drain control boxes, cover crops, tree planting, naturalization, uh, septic upgrades, and even well decommissions. Other projects may also be considered. So to discuss your eligibility, where you are, the amount covered, or your project type, I just recommend you book a phone consultation with me, and I'd be happy to figure out how we can support your project. The Water Fund just launched and is now open for applications. We are submitting or accepting applications until May 31st of this year. So you have quite some time to get ahead on that. Uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash KC Water Fund, or you can find it on our website. Um, projects are being considered by our review committee this June, and you'll be notified about the status of your application by June 30th of this year. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I'm actually going to pass the mic off to Peter Shuttleworth from Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority. Thank you, Peter. You can take it away. Hi. So uh, again, my name is Pete Shuttleworth. I'm a restoration project specialist with Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, so if we can switch to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to give you a brief overview of our uh, funding program, explain some of the funding that we have available, uh, and finish with a short video highlighting some of the projects we've been working on. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll give a thumbs up for the, uh, the change in, in slide. Uh, so this is an overview of the Lake Simcoe uh, watershed. Uh, Kawartha Conservation is our neighbor to the east, uh, TRCA to the south, and the funding that we have available uh, is to uh, landowners uh, within our watershed. So our restoration program works to protect and enhance water quality and quantity, natural ecosystems, and wildlife habitat through tree planting, best management practices, and low impact development. Uh, restoration projects that our team has the pleasure of working on include enhancing ecosystems such as streams, wetlands, forests, and meadows. We also work on enhancing stormwater in our urban environments and with farmers to implement agricultural projects. The current funding that we have uh, seeks to achieve improved water quality is done through stream bank erosion protection, limiting nutrients uh, and sediment loading, removing barriers and uh, decreasing water temperatures. Soil con conservation 
which is a big one for the farming community by addressing water and wind erosion. So these include projects uh, like cover cropping, uh, uh, addressing uh, agricultural runoff and uh, addressing uh, surface erosion. And then enhance natural areas by increasing biodiversity and wildlife habitat, expanding buffers and encouraging other native uh, natural features such as grasslands. Switch, please. So uh, we don't have quite the same uh, amount of farmland in our watershed as, as Kortha does, uh, but still farmlands are a vital part of our landscape. And in the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority watershed, uh, they make up 36%. Uh, the funding that we have has been designed uh, to help uh, landowners find workable solutions to protect soil and water resources on the farm. Next slide, please. So this is a list of uh, funding categories we offer. Uh, the categories highlighted at the top uh, are those that would be of most interest to the farming community. I should point out that uh, funding for tile outlet control structures and wash water treatment systems is only applicable to projects in the Holland Marsh. So a little bit outside the scope of this uh, webinar, but uh, it's there on the list. All of our funding is at 50%. Uh, up to the cap shown, uh, except for uh, planting cover crops, which is 100% funded uh, for seed only and restricting livestock uh, from water courses, so fencing projects, uh, which is 75% funded. Uh, you'll notice uh, planting trees and shrubs is also in bold down there. Uh, I draw attention to this category. Uh, as it's also popular for farmers looking to plant uh, windbreaks around their fields. If you want to switch slides. Uh, so our funding categories have been chosen and our restoration program designed to help implement best management practices to protect your soil, land, livestock. Uh, the goals are to increase efficiencies in resource use and production, improve soil health and increase crop yields, reduce nutrient and soil loss, and protect livestock drinking water to ensure productivity and livestock health. To find out more about our program, uh, discuss project ideas, uh, and uh, take advantage of the funding we have, uh, you just need to contact me. Uh, and we can set up a free no obligation site visit. Uh, I'll come out, we can take a look at, uh, at the issues that you've identified and uh, come up with um, projects to, uh, to best address these uh, uh, that, are, uh, that are in your best interest. Uh, details and contact information can be found on our website at lsrca.on.ca slash funding. And uh, at the end of my presentation, we'll have that up on the screen so you can see it more clearly. So just to highlight a few of the funding categories uh, geared towards soil health, uh, we have planting cover crops. Uh, this is a very popular category, uh, simple to implement and offers great benefit for fields. Uh, again, funding, for this category is at 100% up to $2,000 uh, for the cost of seed. We also offer funding for farm soil and nutrient management planning. So uh, this includes soil testing and uh, uh, developing nutrient management plans. Now funding is up to $500. However, if uh, it's combined with another project, so for example, uh, you need a nutrient management strategy prior to upgrading a manure storage system, then the funding is increased uh, to a thousand for that, um, that portion of it. 
And then the last funding category I'd like to uh, mention is controlling cropland erosion. Uh, this category is designed to help, help implement BMPs that keep your soil where it's needed most, which is on your fields. Uh, so projects in this category uh, can include grassed waterways, wascobs, uh, which are water and sediment control uh, basins, terraces, and drop structures. Uh, funding for this can be uh, can be applied to any uh, project that uh, that suits the, the desired outcome. So it's not limited to uh, to just grass waterways or, or uh, wascobs. We can be a little bit creative uh, to uh, to get the desired out outcome. And yes, next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this funding is available to farmers in the Lake Simcoe watershed. Uh, currently though, we're conducting outreach uh, targeting farms along White's Creek near Beaverton. Uh, so same funding categories, uh, but the outreach we're doing is, is in this specific area uh, at the moment. Uh, the same funding categories apply, but we're trying to address this creek because of the surrounding farmland uh, and its potential as a source of sediment entering Lake Simcoe. Uh, so again, the cost share is up to $10,000 depending on the project type. Uh, and uh, the outreach is involved uh, advertising on social media. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so this is on our social media page. Uh, it's also been put into local papers. Again, highlighting some of the uh, potential projects that, that could be used to, uh, um, to address sedimentation. Uh, as well, we've done a door knocking campaign uh, in the next slide. Uh, so a lot of uh, repeat information, but uh, this, is, this is one of the um, flyers that we've put out. Uh, so if there are, there are any uh, farmers in this area or anywhere in the Lake Simcoe watershed that are interested in our funding, again, please reach out. Uh, contact information is on our website, uh, or you can give us a call at the number at the bottom there. So now I'd like to show you a brief video uh, that highlights some of the uh, work that we've been doing to, uh, to help farmers in the area. The Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority provides funding for various best management practices to any landowner in the Lake Simcoe watershed who wants to improve the environment along with their productivity and profits. The Conservation Authority has been working with this farm in Beaverton to address surface water runoff from the farm. We want to preserve our farmland and to mitigate any negative consequences of our farming operation that might impact Lake or the community. Some BMPs are even covered up to 100% of the cost. Many of the farmers we have worked with are still reaping the benefits of the best management practices they have incorporated. The water coming off this property is laden with sediment, phosphorus, other nutrients and chemicals that was directly going into Lake Simcoe. This whole pond project was designed with the aspect in mind of reducing sediment erosion into Lake Simcoe. Surface water runoff can be addressed by creating a design that implements a variety of agricultural best management practices. When the appropriate BMPs are implemented on the land experiencing runoff issues, the results can be extremely effective. This stormwater pond consists of three ponds, a main pond here, a four pond there, and a four pond in that direction. All the water that flows down from our farm first flows into the four pond. The sediment will settle down into the bottom. The water from the four pond will go into the main pond, hopefully less full of sediment than it was initially in the four pond. We've placed irrigation pumps at each pond. We try to minimize the amount of water that goes from these ponds into the lake by recycling the water onto our farmlands for irrigation purposes. 
Um, the expanse of the restoration and best management practice that have been implemented have been um, very impressive and one of the biggest projects that I've been working on over the last few years. Working with the authority is easy. You can schedule a free, confidential site visit where our restoration specialist will visit your property to identify possible opportunities where you can improve and protect your land. There is no obligation to implement the BMP suggested, but if you're interested, we will be able to help you with the application process. We hope that this project is able to inspire other uh, farmers to want to do work like this. It has been more successful than we had anticipated, and I'm really happy about that. The Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority has been dedicated to conserving, restoring, and managing the Lake Simcoe watershed since 1951. It's our pleasure to work alongside community leaders like yourself to sustain a healthy Lake Simcoe for everyone. Great. So again, thank you for uh, inviting me to present today. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, it has all of my contact information if you want to jot it down, but uh, I believe this will be provided in a follow-up email as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. You are correct. All of this will be sent out afterwards. Um, so if you want to take a quick photo, you can, but we'll, we'll definitely send it out through email. And now I'm just going to pass it right on over to Patrick Essen from the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Um, welcome, Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'll probably breeze through a couple couple slides just because uh, Pete's gone first and most of our goals and and uh, things we're trying to achieve through the program are, are very similar. Um, so we can go to the, the next slide. Um, so the Rural Clean Water Program with TRCA is focused mainly in Peel and York regions. So we've got a pretty um, drastic divide between our landscapes. There's the very heavily urbanized areas and then there's the near urban agriculture and um, mostly up in the headwaters areas, we have uh, a lot of rural land and the green belts and, and there is a, a fairly large portion of agricultural lands scattered throughout. Um, so our program is a, a voluntary confidential program. Um, it's promoting and supporting implementation of BMP practices and projects that address rural water quality, um, environmental enhancement and sustainability, and overall are looking to mitigate climate change and um, help adapt to future climate change scenarios. So we can go to the next slide. So what our program does is provides technical assistance and financial incentive to farm and rural landowners to assist them with the implementation of these BMP projects. Sometimes, um, you know, we may just go out to a property and provide some advice and some further contacts and that might be all our involvement is, but um, sometimes it goes beyond that to financial financial incentives and, you know, further work, uh, seeking further funding, things like that. Uh, next slide. So the overall goals of the program are to protect agricultural lands as a natural resource of major importance. Uh, support farmers and agricultural citizens in our communities as they're valuable contributors to the environment, community, and economy. Um, we're helping to promote uh, healthy rural communities that respect natural environment and water resources. And we're looking to educate and encourage action. Move on to the next. So overall, we're looking to promote and facilitate the adoption of environmentally sound land management practices uh, to protect, restore, and enhance surface and groundwater, air and soil quality, and or fish and wildlife habitat. Next. So the eligibility of the funding for our program differs between Peel and York, but in general, you need to be a resident of Ontario uh, you need to be the registered owner of the property, or there are some circumstances where if you're a leaseholder, you can work with the landowner and facilitate the application through that. 
Um, the property must be within the TRCA jurisdiction to be applicable to our program. And for any of the more infrastructure related grants, they need to meet legal requirements like building codes and, and local bylaws. Um, in Peel specifically, for farms to be applicable to the program, they have to have a farm business registration number and an environmental farm plan in place. Um, and then certain costs are eligible, some are not. There's there's limitations on grant availability. It's more of a first come first serve um, basis. And then um, there is a commitment and collection of information through the program. Um, so the, the funding projects are separated into categories and each has a different percentage, much like the, the slide Pete showed you before. And then there's a, a maximum amount that can be funded through each category and depending which municipality the project's in. You can go to the next one. So this is um, the slide for Peel. York is slightly different, but the categories are similar and the, the funding caps change a little bit. But in general, these are the kinds of projects that could be funded and the percentage that they would be funded up to. Um, if you look at the natural area and enhancement creation category, you'll see that's all the way up to 100%. Um, things like tree planting, like Pete mentioned, hedgerows and, and windrows, things like that, they'd be funded up to 100% as well. And then more of the infrastructure related things, some of those would be primarily led by the landowner with the financial contribution from the program. Um, but again, we provide the technical expertise throughout the whole process and help guide things. Uh, next slide. So how to apply, it's really easy. Um, just need to reach out to us. Um, I would be the main contact. If you go on our website, there's a more of a generic email account that it'll send you to, but that all comes directly to me. Um, so once you reach out, we'll chat a bit about what you're looking to do, um, take a look at your property, and then schedule a site visit to kind of discuss what you want to achieve and how the program can help you provide that technical expertise if that's all you're looking for. Sometimes we'll help link you up with other programs and other staff if they can they can help at all. Um, then once we've we've chatted about the project, it's pretty straightforward from there. If we if everyone agrees on on what the project is is laid out to be, then look to sign agreements and and secure funding and and get the project underway. Uh, next slide. So these are just some examples of more recent projects that we've done. This was one in Peel, um, agricultural crossing on the left. You can see the before. It uh, the the livestock were fenced out from the water course, which is great, but they did need to get access to the other field on the other side. Um, so the landowner would let them through. It's but once they were within the the natural corridor, they had free reign and. It's very limited for his equipment to get through as well. So it was, it was a bit of a mess. Um, we were able to, through the program, to fund an upgrade to the crossing. We put in a new culvert and installed fencing within the corridor and widened everything out so his equipment can get through no problem now. Livestock have access. And in upgrading the culvert, we actually removed a barrier to fish passage. Now fish can migrate up and down the stream without uh, being blocked by the culvert. Next one. Uh, so this was another crossing example, but this one was more of a, a stream restoration. This didn't go through the crossing improvement funding stream. This went through the natural enhancement stream because they just wanted the crossing removed. Um, they no longer used it for anything. They didn't go back to this portion of the property anymore. So you can see the before, it was just a, a mess of old culvert and and debris clogging the stream and creating a pretty large barrier for fish. So we were able to go in and remove all that, restore the stream banks through this small little section here. And you can see immediately after construction and then a couple of years later, it, it looks like we were never there. And on to the next one. Uh, this is an example of a hedgerow planting that we did recently along with some, some fencing. Um, so, the planting category doesn't have to be restricted to hedgerows or windrows. It can, can be used towards that. It can also go towards 
buffers of natural features. If you know there's a pond on the property or um, a grass waterway or a water feature of some kind that you'd like to buffer out and restrict access to, then planting can be used there as well. On to the next one. Uh, this is another example of a, a nice planting. You can see the the um, drainage corridor through the farm and a couple of years later after we've planted and, and seeded and restricted access, it's starting to bounce back nicely. Next one. This was a larger wetland restoration project on a, a horse farm up in Caledon. So it was just a bit of a wet area in the middle of the field. The horses had free access to everything and the landowner mentioned they kept throwing shoes every time they, they ran through there. So he was getting pretty frustrated and wanted it fenced off. So working with them, we were able to, to achieve the grant for the fencing and then also the natural area enhancement to restore this into a wetland feature. Um, so it did involve some heavy machinery work and, and some berm creation to impound more water on the landscape in that pocket uh, and then fence it off and plants it all up and create a nice wetland habitat and keep his horses out. Uh, next one. Uh, it's just some more pictures of the same. Next one. Uh, this is one we run into a lot as well, especially in um, the Oak Ridge's marine area. There's a lot of ponds. Um, and typically, we find that they'll, they'll be mown right up to the edges and landowners are interested in Installing a bit of a riparian buffer helps keep the geese populations at bay and helps with water quality in the long run. Um, so this is a couple of years after restoration and uh, installing a, a bit of a no-mow practice around the pond and it, uh, it's looking a world of difference. To the next one. Uh, another product category is uh, well upgrades. So you can see the before and afters are pretty clear here. Um, these are more of the types of programs that will be primarily led by the landowner themselves with the funding contribution from the program. Uh, on to the next one. Uh, this one's manure storage upgrade. Um, you can see before the manure was just piled right up against the barn. It was when there was a lot of water drainage off the barn, it was you know running into the manure and then down to the nearest water source, a small creek. There was also a, an old well nearby that was getting some of the drainage. So working with the landowner, we moved the manure storage location first and foremost, and then installed a, a concrete bay, which made it easier for them to store the material there and to clean it out. And it kept all the runoff localized. On to the next one. Uh, so this is just a short video um, in working with the TRCA, we look after the rural clean water program, but also we've done a lot of work in the Rouge National Urban Park in Stouffville, Markham area. Um, the program's not applicable there, but the park is doing a lot of work with the tenant landowners in the area to restore marginal lands and wildlife corridors throughout the agricultural field. So this video is just a, a quick example of the types of projects that we've been doing there with them.
All right, I think the last slide is just my contact information. <clears throat> so yeah, it's uh, depending where you're located, if it's in Peel or York, the program's different, but like I said, the easiest way is just to reach out for a chat um, and see what the program can offer. And you know, there's the funding outlined in the program, but as I said before, there's also other funding out there that we can help look into to see if it can grow the project and and uh, help fund fully. So thanks. Amazing. Thank you so much, Patrick. And at this time, I just hope everyone has heard some really great local examples from the different conservation authorities here in the Eastern GTA, um, which is why I'm very excited to welcome our next presenter, Robin Brown from the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Um, the reason being is Robin's going to share more more detail about this, but I believe she has some funding opportunities for folks in the agricultural sector who can tap into multiple sources of funding. So you can layer funding from conservation authorities along with funding from the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Um, so let's pass it over to Robin to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you, Robin. Fantastic. And it's uh, really great to be part of the presentation today. Uh, and I uh, will um, go through as quickly as possible, but I work with the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, which I'm sure most of you are already aware. Uh, we act as third party delivery for the federal provincial money to support agriculture in Ontario. So we do support farmers right across the whole province. And for me, um, beginning April 1st, I will become the regional program lead for East Central Ontario. So I probably will be working much more closely with all of you folks um, in that role. I have I've been the workshop leader with Ontario Soil and Crop uh, for 15 years, so uh, and mainly delivering the educational program. So maybe next slide, it would be great. So we have three main workshops, and the whole goal of of getting. Um, farmers to adopt best management practices exactly the same as all of you have shared to date. The goal is to improve soil, air, uh, water quality, and biodiversity on farms in Ontario. And the way that we um, administer that process is through um, a series of steps. So the first is education. So the farmers who might be able to access cost share would have to come to one of these workshops, either an environmental farm plan, which uh, then outlines, we have 13 cost share categories, very similar to what you've already seen on the slides with um, Peter and Patrick. Um, and even I think Jen Levine's with us today and Kawartha Conservation. So very, very similar support on best management practices and adopting on farm improvement. Improvements. So environmental farm plan, obviously looking after the environment uh, perspective on, on farms, growing your farm profits, looking at our farms from a business perspective, which is equally important for long ter term sustainability on farms in Ontario. And it addresses all of these workshops, even the biosecurity one, uh, biosecurity is specific to commodity. So we have technical experts like veterinarians or beekeepers. Um, um, and other livestock specialists who deliver uh, the biosecurity information to our farmers to help them with improved practices from an educational component. Um, the goal of all of our education, which some of you have indicated is indeed a requirement to tap into your cost share programs, but the whole goal is for them to do a self-assessment of their farms. And in many, many cases, they're saying, I'm doing pretty good in a whole bunch of places, except... <laughs> A, B, C, D, and on it goes. And then they write a plan that says, hey, this is how I'd like to address that and potential opportunities for improvement. And many times when I'm working with them in their action plans, it will be consult with my local conservation authority to see if there's technical support. Um, I've promoted your programs many times. I'd love to have some of those slides to add into a number of workshops I've got coming up. So you'll be hearing from me soon. Um, but uh, really just promoting working together to make a big difference in on farm, uh, the farming landscape in Ontario. All right, we'll go on to the next one. 
So Canadian Agricultural Partnership is a five-year federal provincial agreement. Um, and on the bottom left is the OSCIA logo. Uh, so we act as third-party delivery for farmers in Ontario. It's, it's a fairly big pot of money. Um, and uh, over the years, it, um, it had, we've evolved how we deliver that money. So I'll explain that in the next few slides here. We have uh, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership is our main funding program, um, and it supports over 40 different cost share categories. 13 of them are specific to environmental uh, improvements. Uh, the remainder are then aligning with the business development and sustainability from a business perspective, um, and also the um, I think another 23 categories are in the biosecurity or animal health and welfare categories. The leads bullet point right there is specific to uh, Lake Erie, Lake Erie agriculture de demonstrating sustainability. So specifically for farms in that Lake Erie watershed, which I would expect for you folks uh, involved with CAs, you're maybe aware of that already. Um, but those farmers who are in the Lake Erie watershed uh, need to complete a farmland health checkup which is done by a certified crop advisor. So the farmer works uh, right uh, side by side with a crop advisor. It's kind of like a um, your, your doctor, your GP doing a, an annual physical uh, uh, for people, but it's for the farmer to do it on their soil. And from that checkup, um, those farmers then indicate uh, areas very, very specifically on their farm uh, that they would like to address. And often it's water quality and soil health. So I, I wanted to bring that to your attention because in my short 15 years of delivering these programs, I've seen them evolve. So in, when I first came to Soil and Crop, it, there was a big push on cleaning up Lake Simcoe. Uh, they took the, that, those strategies and success stories. Um, there, there was a fairly big um, pot of money available to, to the Lake Simcoe watershed at that point, and they've evolved that with our delivery at Soil and Crop and now targeting Lake Erie. So uh, my point is, I would expect that we may see this move across the province uh, and addressing farmers uh, closer to the, some of the other Great Lakes as well. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Thank you. We do have additional uh, programs that we deliver. This, uh, you and you folks may be aware of this, Species at Risk Farm Incentive Program and Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Lands. SARPAL has uh, been announced. It will open on February the 14th. So for any of you who have um, farmers that you're working with currently um, who are doing some of those real uh, stewardship uh, themed projects around species at risk. So our PAL targets 10 of them specifically, Little Brown Bat, um, um, Rusty Patch Bumblebee, uh, some of the birds, Loggerhead Shrike, uh, Bobolink. So you'll, you can go into our brochure and read about those. Um, so if a farmer is interested in doing a very targeted approach to supporting species that are on the at risk list, it could be aquatic or vegetative as well, um, then these are some really great programs. It's been a little while kind of um, for us working through that educational uh, approach and creating awareness in the landscape over the years. And last year, when each of these programs opened, the money was spoken for within a day. So definitely there has, we have had great success with the farming community in, uh, in helping them to realize that these opportunities exist and some absolutely fantastic projects uh, happening across the landscape, of which we've seen a number of videos here today, uh, where indeed Ontario Soil and Crop has worked in partnership with some of those folks that we just watched videos of. And we at Ontario Soil and Crop also have a YouTube channel that has a whole bunch of good news stories of success, successful projects across the province. So um, I don't think I have that as a link, but you could certainly just Google that. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, oh, sorry, this is a, just click till you get the whole, the whole picture here. <laughs> so yeah, need to be a legal farm business in Ontario. You need to have a valid farm business registration number or an eligible exemption. So that's usually religious exemption and a premise ID number. So similar to the programs that you folks are delivering um, in, with respect to eligibility, there's one, uh, a, um, accommodation for that farm business registration number, actually two accommodations. You don't need to have a farm business registration number if you are a new farmer. And 
only on the business development, business planning categories. So that's our, our goal is to help people get started. So you have to generate $7,000 gross to get your farm business number. But if you're just starting farming, then that's usually not, not realistic. So we'll support you on some business planning categories there. And then um, in the SARFIP and SARPAL programs, um, if you don't have a farm business registration number, you're still eligible to apply as long as your land is taxed at the farm rate. All right, we can carry on. So these are the three pillars uh, of, of funding that align with each of those three educational opportunities. So economic development aligning with um, the business uh, workshop that we have called Growing Your Farm Profits, funding for projects such as business analysis, market development, and productivity, typically funded at around 50%. Uh, the caps range from 1,000 to 100,000. So um, it's I don't want to go into too much detail. We have a whole document of, I think it's 75 pages. Definitely don't want to share that with you today. <laughs> but if you're interested, you can uh, I can give you the link to get there. Environmental stewardship, big, strong focus on soil health and water quality. No surprise there. Uh, there is some equipment support uh, and erosion control. We do not have a well uh, decommissioning or new well drilling category anymore in that environmental stewardship um, area, but there are 13 categories that uh, are certainly uh, worthy of consideration. And then in the protection and assurances pillar, uh, looking at animal health as well as food safety and plant health. Um, I hadn't mentioned the food safety and plant health, but I don't know if you folks at the conservation authorities get into much around food safety, uh, plant health, uh, or even animal health. But uh, definitely, if you're working with a farmer who has livestock, or a farmer who is um, focusing on um, maybe farm gate sales, um, then there are certainly some opportunities for um, support there. All right, we'll carry on. Oh, there we go. We skipped the, the 15 slides I asked Danielle to hide for this one <laughs> and right into SARPAL. So this is open right now uh, and it is a different pot of money. Uh, so Environment and Climate Change Canada focusing on working with farmers uh, and supporting those recovering us uh, of some species that are on the at risk list. All right, we can just move on to the next slide and it talks about some eligibility and categories. So funding up to 50% to a maximum of 20,000 per farm business. You need to have your environmental farm plan um, and a FBRN or as your farm needs to be designate uh, does tax at the farm rate. And with SARPAL, you will be required to sign a conservation agreement, which uh, just essentially says you, you are going to indeed maintain that project, whatever the project is. So if it's a, a nesting box, you need to maintain it kind of thing. All right, we'll carry on. And these are the categories with SARPAL. There are similar categories with SARFIP, which I'm not sure if it will be launched later this spring. It often has been, uh, but with SARPAL, it is gonna open on the 14th of February. So trees and shrubs, uh, planting in field grass strips, wetland restoration, some fantastic wetland restoration projects happened across the province uh, with uh, conservation authority support and it, particularly Jen Levine at Ducks Unlimited. At Ducks Unlimited. Um, grassland restoration, cross fencing for rotational grazing um, and fencing to exclude livestock from sensitive areas like woodlots. And then an additional one on delayed haying. So some monetary compensation for farmers uh, loss and uh, yield because they're delaying their hang until those uh, bobolink fledglings have left. All right, we'll carry on. We're just about there. So the SARPAL does open on February the 14th at, doesn't say there, but it's at 9 a.m. So uh, I would expect that by noon, it may be fully allocated. So if you know farmers who are thinking about uh, these kinds of uh, programs, uh, then definitely get their ducks in a row <laughs> and get those applications all ready uh, because the, the, it's gonna open and I expect it'll close before the 18th because those funds will be allocated. Uh, but the invoice dates must be after April the 1st. 
2022 and before the 15th of December, uh, because that's the claim deadline is the 15th of December. So uh, from a funding perspective on all of our programs that we deliver, it's a little bit different in that the expectation is that the farmer will do the education, complete it. Do their, which involves a self-assessment. And then they'll have identified areas where they need to make some improvements on farm. Then they can do their application for funding. Application's not hard, it's all online. It's just a question and answer document. I can help them uh, work through it. And then they get an approval or a decline. And that's the usually the date what, of that approval is the, the eligible the date that they can start spending money on their project. So the expectation is not that farmers will get the money. The expectation is that they'll wait to see if they're approved and then they can go ahead and spend the money on that project. All right, we'll carry on and just a couple more slides. So specific to SARPAL, uh, you can email SARPAL at ontariosoilcrop.org. That 519 phone number is indeed to Maria at our head office who administers the SARPAL program. And certainly I can help at a local level. And one more slide, I think, or two more slides. SARFIP, we don't have the announcement of the launch of that one for 2022 just yet. We're hoping it'll come, um, but essentially same kind of thing, 13 best management practices over uh, up to 20,000 maximum per farm in uh, across all of those categories. So in spring of 2021, 500,000 uh, rolled out to farmers in Ontario supporting 100 projects. All right, we'll carry on. Oh, that's it. So I am going to be essentially the regional program lead for East Central Ontario uh, moving forward. Uh, Paul Reeds has done an exceptional job in that role uh, to this date, and uh, he's going to retire then. So I'm really excited for him and excited for the new responsibilities that come with that uh, and available to answer any questions at any time. And I really look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much. And amazing, Robin. Thank you for that very detailed information on how our guests here can layer up so many different funding opportunities. Um, recognizing the time, I do want to leave a little time for question and answer, uh, but I'm just going to skip over to the last slide in case anyone does want to take some pictures of the contact information I have available. Again, all of these slides will be emailed out after the presentation. Um, I also recognize some people are tight on time. So if you gotta head out, that's okay. If you'd like to stick around, I'm gonna um, leave this meeting open until 1.10. So we'll do uh, 10 more minutes of question and answer. If any of our speakers also have to duck out, that's totally fine. Um, so feel free to hop on the mic. You can raise your hand. You can pop your question in the chat. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing uh, just in a moment so we can see each other. Alrighty, I'm not sure. Has any have any questions popped into the chat during the presentation? Uh, I haven't seen any. Like just introductions so far. All right. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah. Anyone? Anyone want to pop on? I do have a question. Sure. If that's okay. Uh, I just wondered. Um, in a couple of the videos that uh, I watched. Um, I went through your websites yesterday and the day before. Um, there's a couple of times where the um, comment has been made that the project has made a significant improvement on nutrients, nutrient load and water quality. And I wonder if there's any data to support the pre-project and post-project on that, those comments in those videos. That is a great question from my from my angle, um, our integrated watershed management do take water samples from across our watershed. However, at this time, we don't have site-specific sampling to um, quantify the impact at each project site. Uh, but I'd be happy to chat with you more to see what would be, like, if there is an effective method for us to put this together for landowners, I'd love to learn more about what I could do. I don't know if anyone else, Patrick or Peter, if you have any uh, yeah, so um, for our general projects, uh, we do have 
an algorithm to work out uh, 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 phosphorus uh, amounts uh, pre and post uh, project. Uh, for certain projects, certainly some of the larger projects, um, like the ones that you saw in the, in the video, uh, there is monitoring uh, pre, uh, pre and post construction, uh, as well as during construction. So we have uh, much more specific data for, for some of those larger projects. For, for me anyway, it would be potentially really impactful for me to be able to share that some of that information with the farmers that I have at workshops and all of my environmental farm plan workshops through March, uh, sorry, through February and March are full. I'm opening up more. Um, and I would love to be able to, to say, you know, before the project, it was this, and after the project, it was that. Um, and it, it, it farmers typically want to see the numbers. So uh, that would be really helpful if you're interested in sharing anything, any of that information with me. Um, I think I'll, I'll talk to you um, at, outside of this webinar to um, invite you to share some information or even come to one of my workshops coming up where I would have farmers that would be potentially from each of your watersheds. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I did notice a question in the chat from Roy, um, who's asking if rural landowners with tenant farmers would be eligible for funding through all of these different projects. And I can say that they would be eligible um, through our program. However, keeping in mind, similar to other programs displayed today, um, there must be a commitment for the longevity of the project. So we're not looking to do something and have the tenant farmer just, you know, ride past it, um, but we'd love to work in partnership with tenant farmers as well. Yeah, for uh, Lakes and Co. Uh, certainly those are, are uh, eligible projects. Uh, it's actually great to hear that tenant farmers are interested in doing some of the, the projects. Uh, it's usually a harder sell than the, the landowner themselves. Uh, Yes, they are eligible. Um, any uh, funding application that we receive would require the landowner um, authorization anyway. So uh, there would definitely be the, uh, uh, the agreements all around. Same for uh, TRCA. There's projects we've done in the past where the uh, tenant's been really the lead on the project with the landowner's consent. So. As long as that's laid out in the beginning, um, then the the application is just filled out a little differently. Great. And and same with our programs. I always say a farmer can spend money wherever he wants to, <laughs> and uh, often a farmer is the one who's renting the land. So. Um, yeah, you, that's certainly eligible. And um, from what I understand, there's been some great headway made with some of those uh, landowner agreements in the Bruges National Park for long-term commitments. And that bodes very well for um, landowners spending money to do those improvement projects. So hopefully we can see some of those lasting <laughs> agreements <laughs> in other areas as well. Great. Um, we have time for a few more questions. If anyone else wants to hop on the mic, give it a moment. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> All right. Seems like we have a bit of a quiet group today and we're probably good to go. Um, at this time, I do just want to thank all of our presenters. So Peter, Patrick, and Robin, thank you so much for joining us and sharing about your local resources and examples today. Um, and I also want to thank everyone else who's joining us. I hope you're all safe. I'm watching the snow and rain come down right now and uh, hope everyone gets home safely today. I just hope you enjoy the rest of your day and week. And again, I'll be in touch very shortly after this webinar with copies of the slides, contact information, and the recording. Thank you so much. We're gonna we're gonna close up. Bye everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.